morning. Good morning. I have the pleasure of welcoming you in the room and those of you joining us online to today's worship service. We are so glad you are here, uh, wherever you may be. As we gather this morning, there are a few announcements that we would like to share with you all. As a reminder to those of you in the sanctuary, you can find all of the announcements and uh, on a printed handout and a bulletin of today's service located in the back. For those of you joining us online, the same handouts can be found by clicking the link sent to your email. We are grateful to welcome the Reverend Brian Wallace uh, today. He graciously has stepped in to lead us this Sunday as Pastor Dave and Sharon travel for a family funeral this weekend. Next Sunday, October 3rd, we will celebrate both the Sacrament of Baptism and Worldwide Communion Sunday. We'll have elements for communion in the building and if you'd like communion supplies in your home, please call the church, and we'll get some to you. Additionally, Sunday school for all will be at 945, and the youth group bonfire will occur at uh, Thornburg Conservation Park from 6 to 8 p.m. Lastly, a new adult discussion group is forming to discuss the book, A Bigger Table, Building Messy, Authentic, and Hopeful Spiritual Community. The group will meet for an hour on six Mondays this fall, beginning on October 18th. Copies of the book are also available to pick up in the back of the sanctuary. If you have any questions, Pastor Dave has asked you to reach out to him. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please stand. We gather together in praise and worship for our faithful God, because our help and hope rests always in the Lord our God. We bring, we bring our, our praises and thankful, and thankful responses to our saving God. God. Blessed be the Lord our God, who is our security and home, and whose mercy and grace frees us from all that traps us. Blessings, Blessings honor, and glory be to the Lord, Lord our God. God. We come together to praise worship our all-powerful God, because we are confident of God's generous care over us. Our, our eternal, eternal trust is in the name of the Lord our God, who is our Maker, our Savior, and our timeless home.
Join me in the prayer of confession. Let's pray. O oh, Father, forgive us for thinking small thoughts of you and for ignoring your immensity and greatness. Lord Jesus, forgive us when we forget that you rule the nations and our small lives. Holy Spirit, we offend you in minimizing your power and squandering your gifts. We confess that our blindness to your glory, O triune God, has resulted in shallow confession, tepid conviction, and only mild repentance. And we continue, have, have mercy, mercy upon, upon us, in Jesus' name, name. Amen. amen. People of God, you know the good news. God has, has forgiven, forgiven us all our sin, sin erasing the record that stood, stood against us, us with its legal demands. Yes, this God set aside, nailing it to the cross. In Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, therefore, we are forgiven. forgiven. This is, in fact, the truth. We are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have domain over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Well, good morning. Good morning. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have the kids come and sit right here. So you can come forward for the children's sermon. And I'm going to kind of stand here so people at home, you can still hear and kind of see it. So if you guys come right here. Okay, now I have a microphone. So why don't you guys grab a seat right there, and I'll move right here. Good morning. I love doing children's sermons public supply because they're like, who are you? Okay, how many of you love the pool? Anybody love the pool? Okay, so I have kids. They are now 12 and 14. But when my son uh, used to be smaller, much smaller, he's 5 foot 11 now, so we don't do this. He used to stand on the side of the pool and he didn't, he wasn't a huge fan of jumping in the water. So I would stand there with my arms up, ready to catch him. And I would say, buddy, go ahead and jump. You can trust me. And after doing a lot of this, eventually he would jump. Now, how many of you have ever heard the word faith? Right? If you've been around church long enough, you've heard the word faith. And we usually think of this idea of faith as something that we believe in. But in a few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about a little different way to understand that word. It means to trust. And when we say that we have faith in God, what we are saying is that we trust. We trust in God. It's not just what we believe that God is real and God exists, but that that God loves us and that we can trust that God wants what is best for us. And the best way, the best way that I can help you understand what that means is it means that we are standing on the side of the pool and God is standing in the water saying, it's okay, buddy, you can jump, I'll catch you, you can trust me. That's the best way that I can help you kind of see what we mean when we say that we can trust in God. All right, would you guys pray, guys pray with me? And the way I do it is I do it responsive, so I'll say a line and everyone, all God's children, can repeat it. Okay? Dear God, Thank you, Thank you that you love us. Help us to trust you and to live a life that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks, guys. second scripture reading comes from Mark chapter 9 verses 14 to 29. 
When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe, and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, What are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak, and whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. He answered them, You faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you are able. All things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him, and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he was able to stand. When he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, This kind can come out only through prayer. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning once again. As was said during the introduction by Hannah, my name is Ryan Wallace. I have the pleasure of serving on the staff of Pittsburgh Presbytery, and I have been out these ways uh, a couple of times in the last few years, and I'm delighted to be here again. I wish the circumstances were different, as Dave and Sharon are away this weekend for a funeral. And before we go any further, I would actually ask us to join in prayer for them, just so we don't overlook that later in the service. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we come to your word, we lift up our brother and sister Dave and Sharon and their entire family. As they are gathered together this weekend to celebrate and to mourn, may the comfort that only comes from the from a empty tomb and from the power of your resurrection rest upon them. And may these times bring healing and hope into their lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Any of you ever heard the phrase, you can do anything you put your mind to? Anybody heard that phrase? That phrase is rubbish of the highest order. I could put my mind to being a world-class athlete all I want, and it was never, ever going to happen. You can put your mind to transforming your spouse or partner into the world's perfect spouse or partner, and, well, that's just never going to happen, now is it? You could put your mind to stopping the myriad of forms of injustice and inequity in the world, and guess what? It's not going to happen. Putting your mind to something isn't enough. Now, look, I understand what the phrase is trying to get at. The idea is that if you are going to do something, if you're going to make change, you not only have to physically do it, you have to engage the right kind of thinking, right? So you're never going to lose weight if you tell yourself, I'm never going to lose weight. You have to believe, I'm going to get healthier and lose weight, and that will help you change your behavior. So I get it. But just the mindset alone, well, that's not really going to do much. But this is church. What about prayer? What if we go beyond just putting our mind to something and invite God into it? Surely, surely... If God's involved, and if we talk about prayer, then, well, anything is possible. After all, Jesus says, like he said in this passage we just read, all things are possible for the one who has faith. All things. 
All things are possible for the one who has faith. Likewise, uh, there's verses like this. I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 3.14. And again from Jesus, if you have but the faith of a mustard seed, you can say this mountain, rise up, and it will be cast into the sea. Surely, it seems to me that if we simply pray enough, do enough, believe enough, then we can do anything. That it goes beyond just the right mindset. It comes down to praying. Our passage today comes from the Gospel of Mark. And this passage is one of the passages that is skipped in the lectionary, the thing that provides a three-year cycle of the readings that many of our churches follow. And I understand why they skipped this passage. Demons and boys being cast into the fire don't really mm, bring about fuzzy memories. But there's a really important part of this passage that I don't want you to miss, and that's the setting. Just before this, Jesus and his closest three disciples have been up on the mountain for the transfiguration. And on the mountain, it was once again affirmed that Jesus is God's own beloved son. Right after this, after a little debrief of why they couldn't drive out this demon, the disciples begin to argue amongst themselves, wondering who is the greatest. And Jesus has to kind of set them right on that point. Why is this important? Because you see, the early years of Jesus' ministry in the book of Mark are largely marked by winds, things going well, things going in the way that Jesus and his disciples would want them to. But starting now in Mark 9, we're beginning to see that things are getting more challenging. That some of the things are going to get a little bit rougher. That the challenges are ahead of them. And in the midst of this text, we come to this passage. On the surface, there's nothing very unique about this passage. It's like a lot of the demon stories within the, in the New Testament. That the demon encounters Jesus. Jesus challenges the demon, drives it out. Jesus is able to drive the, the demon out, and everyone else goes home whole. But there's a couple unique layers to the story that I want to explore. But first, I need to make a preliminary point. One of the things I love about this passage is that the disciples don't succeed. They're not able to drive out the demon. They try and they fail. And I think that this is a really important lesson, or a really important reminder for us. Maybe you all are better people than I. There's a decent chance of that, actually. But I'm going to guess that you have moments in the Christian life that you, well, blow it. That you're not the person that you know God calls you to be. You don't have the patience you know you're supposed to that you're supposed to have. You don't manage to love someone in the way that you know you should. There are moments in the Christian life that we blow it. Far more than probably we want to admit or even realize. And yet what's wonderful about this story is that the disciples, in spite of their repeated failures in this chapter, not being able to drive out the demons and then arguing with one another about who is the greatest, Jesus does not fire them. Does he get frustrated? Yes. He actually, in this passage, says, Oh, you faithless generation. I'm going to give you the modern English translation. You bunch of idiots. It was literally kind of what he was saying. Okay? It's nice, you faithless generation, but really it was you bunch of idiots. And he was talking to his disciples, to be clear. And yet, he doesn't fire them. The same disciples that mess it up in this section mess it up in the next one, desert him when in his hour of need and challenge are the disciples that founded the church and the reason why we're gathered here this morning. There is tremendous comfort in knowing that God's grace that brings us to salvation is also the grace that allows us to live a Christian life that when we mess up, not if, that when we mess up, God's grace still restores us. In short, if you have been wondering all your life how you could earn God's love, how you could be good enough, behave well enough, pray right enough, and go to church enough, you can stop. You can stop. 
God's love can't be earned. God's love is to be recognized, accepted, and responded to, but it is not to be earned. With that preliminary point, let's talk about this conversation between the father of the boy and Jesus. Here's the bottom line. This boy has been tormented by this demon, and the father is desperate. He is desperate, and he brings the boy to Jesus' disciples. They're not able to drive out the demon. Jesus returns, so he presents him to Jesus. And this is what it says. Father. The father says, but if you can. But if you can. If you can do anything, the father says, show us some compassion. But if you can do anything, show us some compassion. I love that line. Anything? Anything. If you can do anything, come on. This is Jesus' reply. But if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. Or everything is possible for the one who has faith. And then the, boy, and then the father replies, immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Anything is possible for the one who believes. Anything is possible for the one who has faith. Now, if you are newer to church, you can probably skip this next section. I'll come back to you. But if you've been around church for a while, I want you to think about the ways in which this type of verse, that anything is possible for the one who believes, can be twisted, misused, and manipulated. Anything is possible for the one who believes. When I was 23 years old, I was serving as a student chaplain in a hospital. And in the hospital setting at 23, I encountered all kinds of things that I never, ever, ever want to experience again. Sadly, I have, but that comes the life of ministry. But one that stands out to me more than anything else was one of the first nights I was on call. And I was called to the bedside of an older gentleman who was on hospice care and was expected to pass. But I was called there for his son. Now, his son was new to the church. He had not grown up in church at all. And his son was, I mean, he was upset about his father passing, but he seemed to be really upset about something else. And as we dug down through the layers, what finally came out was that he had had a number of friends who had introduced him to church and had helped him come to faith, who had asked him if he knew if his father was saved. Did his father know Jesus? Had his father accepted Jesus? The problem was that the son didn't know. He didn't know that. He himself was new to the church. And he said, you know, I, I tried to talk to my dad, but we just never got very far. And what, in, in sharing this with his friends, his friends had basically turned it around and said, well, if you had just prayed harder, your father would have come to faith. Now, with friends like that, you seriously don't need enemies. So, what do we do with this passage? Well, there's two things that we can just disregard at the outset. The first is the idea that just simply praying enough, obeying enough, going to church enough, can earn you something of God's favor. Love is not to be manipulated. It can't be. One of my seminary professors put it this way. God's love is not a Clark bar machine. You can't push the right buttons, do the right things, and automatically get what you want. It's not how God works. So no, you can't manipulate God. That's one extreme that we can throw out. But the other one that we have to throw out is this idea that prayer is merely... A, an act of self-comfort. That it is merely something that is a spiritual placebo that just makes you feel better. No, Scripture clearly tells us that prayer really matters, that prayer really works. So we have to throw that one out. So with the two extremes thrown out, what then are we left with? What do we do with this passage that says anything is possible for the one who has faith, or anything is possible for the one who believes. Now, I have been striving to live the Christian life for just, just over 40 years. 
And in the last mm, 22, I've actually taken that seriously, of studying scripture and learning how to interpret it and apply it correctly. And what I've learned is this. When you come up against something that you can't figure out how to interpret or how to understand properly, you're usually doing one of two things. You're either asking a question to which God has not shown us the answer, right? There are things that even the Bible tells us that simply have not been revealed to us. Or you're thinking about the question the wrong way. In other words, your approach to the question is the problem. That's the reason you're not getting an answer. And I think in this case, of what do we do with a verse that says, all things are possible for the one who believes? I think it's a case of the second. And let me explain why. If you ask me when my quote-unquote faith in Jesus was the strongest, I would probably tell you it was the latter half of my years of college. I was wrestling with a call to ministry. I was surrounded by friends and professors who were investing in me and helping me discern that call to ministry. It was a time in which my faith felt so real and felt so alive. But you know what? If I think about it, my faith now feels very different than it did then, but in some ways now, it's stronger. It doesn't feel the same, but it's been refined. It's been adjusted. It's been tweaked. It's been nuanced by things that I have learned and by things that I have experienced. And in many ways, my faith now feels more durable and sustainable, even if it doesn't feel as strong. You see, here's the thing. I love numbers. I really do. I love to quantify things. I was a physics major. I love numbers. I love data. When my daughter says she has math homework, I get excited. Then she reminds me that she's in algebra honors and doesn't need my help. Fine. I love numbers. But you can't quantify your faith. You can't say, well, at this point in my life, I had 75 faith points, and then I had this happen, and my, I went, dropped to 45 faith points, and then that happened and dropped to 25 faith points, and then I kind of rebounded to 55. It's not how faith works. You can't quantify it with a number. So with that in mind, what do we mean when we say faith? Well, you see, what we normally think of when we think of faith is this idea of belief right? Faith is something that you believe. And yet, the word for faith is more complicated than that. It, there's more to it. And it has actually a lot more to do with to trust than it does to believe. Some have said that faith is where trust and belief meet. Even the demons believed in Jesus. The disciples trusted him. They actually had Faith has always been more of a verb, an action, something you did rather than something you simply thought of. And so when I think about this line and I change it from anything is possible for the one who believes or anything is possible for the one who has faith to this, anything is possible for the one who trusts God. Well, that, that I can get behind, that I understand. Because if there's one thing that I have learned in these last 20 years that makes my faith now stronger than it was 20 years ago is this. I am more convinced, I am more sure that God is always faithful and that God will fulfill God's promises. Those two things I remain more convinced of than I was. I trust more now in God's mercy, in God's judgment, in, and in God's grace than I did 20 years ago. And I believe I believe and affirm that I trust in God. And if that's what it means to believe that anything is possible, then I'm in. Then I am in. In this passage, that's what we see the Father doing. The Father's desperate. Who can blame him? And he finally lays his son before Jesus and says, if you can do anything, show us some compassion. See, that's what faith is. Faith is trusting that God knows better what you need than you do. Faith is trusting that God's answer to your prayer is the right one, even if it's not the one you wanted. 
faith is believing that in the midst of the messiness and the pain and the hurt, God is still faithful through it all. The point of faith isn't something you quantify by a number, but rather that you trust in God. That you trust in God's divine wisdom and providence. That you trust in God's everlasting promises. I think I resonate with this story for another reason. A few years ago, my son was just about to start first grade. And he had not been feeling real great. He had some kind of a stomach bug. And I was out mowing the lawn. And my wife came out and she said, I think something's really wrong with Andrew. And I went, oh. And I came in, and sure enough, something was really wrong with Andrew. And the only way I can explain it is that he was incoherent. He wasn't responding appropriately. He seemed out of his mind. And remember that whole serving in a hospital thing I told you about? Well, I was the neurosurgery chaplain, which means I am programmed and wired to spot neuro to spot neurological symptoms with ease. And I realized that my son was having some kind of neurological event, and those are bad. So I hop him in the van. Again, he's not coherent. He's not passed out, right? He walked out to the van, but he wasn't engaging appropriately. We get to Children's Hospital. We walk in. And what I will tell you is that if you've ever had to wait in the emergency room, be glad. Because when you don't have to wait, it means they don't know what's wrong with you, and they're not sure you're going to make it. So we got to the triage nurse. The triage nurse rushed us right back. We were in the main unit, and then within five minutes, they had transferred him to the red unit, right across from the, from the nurse's station, where the sickest and most critical patients in Children's Hospital are. Because they had no idea what was wrong. They immediately began running a whole series of tests, and again, downside of having spent time in a neurosurgery unit, I knew what the tests were, I knew what they were looking for. Thankfully, they came out and they said, so Mr. Wallace, and I said, you ran a CT scan and there's no blood and no tumors. And they said, y yeah. I said, good, what's next? And then they figured out, I knew a little bit more than I really would have liked to know in that moment. Long story short, his stomach virus had gotten into the spinal fluid and in the fluid around his brain and was causing neurosymptoms. It's very rare, but it does happen. They told us between six and 10 times a summer usually, kids of that age, this happens, they come in, within 12 to 24 hours, the symptoms subside and they're fine. That was it, that was what was wrong. Now I gotta tell you, as a dad, I rocked it, I did. I made all the right calls the whole way. I stayed very calm, very focused. I talked to every doctor. We made all the right decisions. We sedated my son. We did the spinal tap. We did all those things, and I was a rock. And that night when he came out of it and woke up, we were like, oh, man, whew, that was over. So I go home that night. I come back the next morning, and I walk into his room, and all of a sudden, all the emotion and fear and scared that I had pushed down yesterday came pouring out. And my poor seven-year-old could not figure out what is wrong with his dad. You see, it wasn't that I wasn't scared. It wasn't that I wasn't feeling all the emotions. I just pushed him down because I had to. But in the moment, it all came out. And as I sat in the corner of my son's hospital room trying to compose myself, Thank goodness for a Lego set. Man, that worked beautifully to get him focused on that. I heard what I can only describe as the inaudible voice that I have maybe heard twice in my entire life. It simply said, I've got him. I've got him. Again, I made all the right calls. I did what I needed to do as a dad. And yet in the midst of it, it was a powerful reminder that my son's not my own. He's not my own. I mean, he is. There's moments I would rent him out in a heartbeat. But he's not my own. He belongs to God. My daughter is not my own. She belongs to God. My own life is not my own. Your own life is not your own. For we, in life and in death, belong to God. That's what faith is. Faith is not trusting enough, praying enough, behaving enough, and hoping that you will get what you want 
if you do those things. That's not faith. Faith is trusting that through all of life's challenges, through the ups and the downs, the pleasant surprises, and the tragic, and I mean tragic, losses, that God has this, that God has us, that we belong to God. That even when the outcomes to our most earnest prayers are no or not yet, that God is still in charge and that we can still trust in God. In this story, in this story, our model, I believe, is the Father. I believe it is the Father who simply comes to Jesus and says, if you can do anything, show us some compassion. That would be my invitation for all of us. That no matter what it is, no matter what the pain, the challenge that you're facing right now, whether it feel huge or feel trivial and insignificant, that we would look at the example of the Father and not imagine to ourselves how we can behave our way, pray our way into getting something from God that we want. But rather, to lay before God the challenges, the hurts, the pains that we are facing, and simply say, if you can do anything, show us some compassion. And listen for the reply that says, I've got this. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are faithful in all things. You are the author of life itself. And Lord, in the hardest moments of our lives, remind us that you have us that we belong not to ourselves, but to you in life and in death. Lord, remind us of that. Show us some compassion as we seek to be your faithful disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
come now the time in our service in which we share with one another and we lift before God our joys and concerns. Are there joys and concerns to be shared this morning? Prayers for Sue, for Susanna, or, or, who is um, in the end stages of hospice care, and prayers for her in that time, and also for her family. Are there others? Anything from our friends online? Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, you are the author of life. You are the faithful one, even in the midst of our unfaithfulness. And Lord, for that we are grateful. We are grateful that your love sustains us and carries us through the most challenging of times. Lord, and on this day, we lift before you the world, your world, the world that you created that is not the way that you had intended it to be. But yet, Lord, you are faithful in the midst of that. Lord, for those who are hurting and in pain, we pray for comfort. For those who have lost, we pray for them to be restored. For those who are searching for a new direction, we pray for guidance. And Lord, for those who are nearing the end, who are nearing a time of being joined with you, we pray for comfort and hope. Lord, we are your people. You call us to be disciples in the places that we go and to love those who we encounter. Lord, help us to be your faithful disciples in all that we say, and in all that we do. Lord, we pray all this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In Proverbs 22, we're taught those who are generous are blessed. What would it take for you to act out your generosity today? Is there someone who would delight in hearing your voice as you make an unexpected phone call? Can you share your food, your clothes, your time with someone in need? Will you offer not only money to support this congregation, but an additional gift to allow us to share bread with the poor? For your generosity becomes a blessing, not only for those who receive from you, but for you. Eager to be a blessing and to be blessed, let us receive our morning offering. Those who are worshiping in the building this morning will note that there are offering plates at the rear of the sanctuary. You may feel free to leave a gift there now or on your way out of the room in a few moments. And those who are worshiping online will find instructions on the screen. <laughs>
Let us pray over the offering. God of all good gifts, you pour out blessings each and every day, like the water which comes from a natural spring. Knowing we are made in your image, we pray you will receive these tithes, gifts, and offerings. Multiply them for good and put them to use. Accept our desire to honor you with what we've given and help us celebrate the ways this offering will become a blessing for others. Amen. Woke up in the dark 
One of the fun parts about doing Paul's play in COVID is having explained to you how I will receive you after the service. So I will be at the back. If you want to come nowhere near me, that I will take no offense, but I will greet people at the back. I have been fully vaccinated for months now, so um, I'm happy to shake hands. Uh, I don't hug, but that has nothing to do with COVID. I'm just not a hugger, so that's all. <laughs> Friends, receive the benediction. You are God's chosen people, a holy nation, a people set apart, that people might see your good works and give praise to your Father who is in heaven. So go this day as Christ's ambassador, sent to a world that needs to know the love, the joy, the peace, and the hope that comes through Jesus Christ. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the people of God said, Amen.